is the founder and managing director of Academic Language Experts, ALE. He founded the company in 2011 to help academic scholars publish their research around the world. Since then, Avi has grown the company, which has helped over 500 clients publish their research. Prior to founding the company, Avi worked as a translator editor in various humanities and social sciences fields. His mission is to assist scholars with publishing and share their invaluable research in academic forums globally. Avi has a master's degree from Hebrew University in Jerusalem. There will be a Q&A session at the end. Feel free to submit your questions via the app, which I've got open, or just put your hand up and a microphone will reach you. Without further ado, Avi, over to you. Morning, everybody. How are we doing? Good. Good. Fantastic. Um, I actually got here this morning, came straight off the plane, jumped on the train, got here on time, was all excited, walked in that door, and wanted to turn around and run straight back out. Um, I was not expecting such a magnificent auditorium to give this lecture. I'm used to um, interactive and taking questions from the audience and and having it be lively, so please do feel free throughout to um, you know raise your hand, interrupt me, and ask a question, clarify. I'll also say that in order to get here on time this morning, I had to wake up at 3 a.m., so you'll forgive me in advance if I say things that are totally unintelligible. Um, but hopefully we'll try and learn a little bit today about the world of academic translation and editing, um, and how uh, we can make ourselves better academic translators and editors. Um, just by a quick raise of hands, how many people here would define themselves as an academic translator or editor already? Excellent. How many of you who are raising your hands, keep them up, um, would have helped a, an academic scholar uh, publish a paper? Okay, excellent, fantastic. So my I'll start off by, uh, people always ask about, um, about you know, uh, slides at the end. You can jot down my email, shoot me an email, and I'm happy to send you all the slides. Um, and I think that it's also being recorded, so you can get the recording later on. Um, let me ask you as follows. What is our goal? Or what is our client's goal? Um, when they send us an email, shoot us an email, and say, can you help me? answer to that is, well, their goal is to translate the paper. But I would disagree. Um, I think you'll hear a lot over the next two days about understanding clients' deep needs. Sometimes they're called deep needs. Sometimes they're called, um, there are other terms. But it's trying to get into the head of the client and understand, why is he coming to me? What is his pain point, right? What is the issue that he's facing, if he or she um, is facing, and how can we help them with and therefore, my contention is, is that the pain point is exactly what appears here up on the screen, is that scholars are worried and concerned about their publication, okay, and making sure that their research gets to the places that it needs to get to, okay? And in order to do that, we need to understand what exactly is important to the scholars. Now, you may ask, well, what does that have to do with my work? I receive the text, I translate the text, I send it back. Everything else is there is their problem. But I would disagree. Um, and I would contend that we can only be good translators and editors if we really understand our clients and understand how it is that we can best help them. So a lot of the things that I will show you here are not necessarily things that we ourselves need to do, but it's very important, it's critical that we're aware of them in order to best help uh, scholars. So why is it important to the scholar? First of all, he's writing, he or she is writing, they're writing the research um, and want to make sure that this is essentially their baby. This is what they've been working on for, could be months, could be years, it could be it's a life project. And it, they want to maximize the impact, um, especially if it's practical research that may affect policy, it may affect science, it may save people's lives. It's critical that that research Right, yeah, uh, maximize the impact. Um, in addition, they want to take it global. Okay, 
uh, we're seeing a, a very sharp spike and increase in foreign language scholars who want to publish their research. Uh, they were always there, but now they have access through open access journals and other fora to some of the places that they never had access to before. However, they face very serious issues when it comes to language, and that's why that's where we come into play. Um, and in order to, to put it into a global audience, we need to remember that 80% of the journals that are published are published in English. And therefore, whether we like that or not, or whether we agree with it or not, um, those are the facts on the ground. Um, and I guess maybe you would call it a more uh, selfish or a more um, it, uh, approach is the fact that for better or for worse, many scholars are judged based on their publications, right? And in order to receive a promotion, in order to get ten have professorship, tenure, they are judged by, okay. Um, here's a comment that I came across that sort of brings out this idea. I'll give you a second to, to look it over. Uh, but basically, the idea here is, is that I guess there, there used to be a, a more purity in publication. Um, there used to be, we're publishing research for the sake of the research, for the sake of promoting science. However, nowadays there are, there's a lot more pressures, and over the years um, there's become pressure. There are, pressures have come from a, a few different in a few different ways. Number one is it's not enough to publish anymore. We need to publish in high impact journals, okay? Um, and that means that it needs to be peer reviewed, of course, but it also means there there's a term called impact factor, and scholars all of a sudden have to worry about not only will my research get out there, but where is it going to be published? Who is going to be reading it? How much? How respected will it be? Will it be requoted in other articles? And all these things are critical. The second thing is, is that whereas scholars used to take a number of years to write their research, sometimes now there's this pressure to pop out a new article every few months, which can be very, very draining. Now, I'm not saying that this is the ideal situation. In fact, I recently met with a scholar who came to us about translating his manuscript um, in Bible studies, and he told me that he only writes a book once every five or six years, which in today's, or, or only, only puts out a publication once every five or six years. And today, um, in today's world, that's very rare. So I said, how, did you, how do you still have a, a job, right? And he turned around and said to me, well, every book that I write wins awards. Right? So there is a value to taking time and to doing the research correctly. There's no question. But for those, for, but for many scholars, they feel this pressure. Okay. So now let's talk about us a little bit. What's in it for us translators? Or why is it that we're drawn to this field that is academic translation, that is academic editing? Um, we'll get some of the challenges later on. But what, is, what are the motivations? So first of all, we use our expertise, right? If there's something we're pat if there's a field we're passionate about, some of us have, have studied translation studies, some of us have studied other fields, and it may be that we're, we are semi, we consider ourselves semi scholars ourselves, or full scholars ourselves. Um, and this is something that we're, this, these are texts that we're interested in, we're passionate about. We're on the forefront of research. We know about what's coming up even before any anyone else does, uh, and that can be really exciting, really challenging. We're always gaining knowledge. We're always learning new things. Every time we read a new article, we're, we're challenging ourselves to understand it. If it's new terminology, if it's new theory, or even if it's a literature review, we're constantly getting smarter and smarter to the point where oftentimes more veteran academic translators and editors sort of become quasi-reviewers themselves. In a certain way, you've actually seen a lot more studies and research than maybe some of the scholars themselves have. So you may have insights in the past do this with caution, but in the past I've actually connected two scholars who I said, they're working on similar things. So as long as I check with each one, I connect them, and now all of a sudden they have a new collaboration. Um, and that, that, that's a really exciting uh, opportunity. Um, the client base is very loyal, okay? If we're, if we're thinking about, you know, maybe in other lines of translation and editing work, so, you know, they find some, we have this concern, they find someone cheaper, they find someone uh, easier to work with next week, so there I go. In academia, this is really what I like to call a lifetime relationship. And this is what I tell scholars that when I, when I initially talk to them and I'm pitching them about our service or about you know, the translators that they're going to work with is don't think about this article and publishing this article. Think about 
building a relationship with someone really for your career. Um, and that loyalty guarantees us a certain amount of comfort. Even though we're freelancers and we never know exactly when the work is going to come in and how much it'll come in and feast or famine. But with all that being said, we, we know we have a loyal client base. Um, better timelines. You can disagree. Feel free to chuck a tomato at me if you disagree. Um, but I have seen the difference between being legal or medical where everything was needed yesterday. If I got a if I had a nickel for every time I was, I, I asked what the deadline is, and they said yesterday, I could retire. Um, but uh, academics have usually been working on their research for a few months, a few years. So, um, in fact, I recently was on a Facebook forum where someone posted a job about about uh, it was a it was a handwritten letter from the 1940s uh, in German, and they wanted to translate it to English. And someone asked what the timeline was, and they said it's a rush job. And someone else responded, it's been sitting there for 80 years. You're telling me that all of a sudden it's a rush job? Um, and, I, and, and, and that's something that all of us deal with. But I do find that in academia, there are rush projects. But as a general rule, uh, we do have a little bit more time and breathing space to do our work, sleep on it, take our time, go back to it, revise, and then submit. Um, and less haggling over rates, which you may or may not, I, 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 I'm not sure whether you're going to agree with me on this one, okay? Um, when I say less haggling over rates, that doesn't mean that all of a sudden they're going to pay you what you want. Um, what I mean is that once you have proven your value and you have proven your worth, and that's the bottom line here, by the way, is that what we're trying to do, and this is what really any employee does in any company, is make themselves indispensable. We need to make ourselves criti a critical part of the process, and we need to understand the entire process in order to do that. But once we become a critical part of the process, so if we say, listen, this is how we value our time, assuming that the scholar can pay for it, right? They don't have the money, they don't have the money, but assuming they can, there, there's a certain value to that. That doesn't happen overnight, it doesn't happen right away, but it does happen over time. Um, but academics don't have money. Everyone, I see this, I see this online all the time. But academics, right, have, and are, are, are you know, the poorest people on earth. I don't know, you know if, that's, if that's true or not true. I don't know what everyone gets paid. What I do know is this, is that in specific countries, and we will see a little bit more about that in a second, but in many countries, most Western countries, especially the ones that are non-English speaking to begin with, there are stipends, there are research budgets, which can be used for translation and editing. And therefore, all of a sudden, this money that does not necessarily need to come out of the individual's pocket, but rather it comes from the university. That doesn't mean that it's endless, but it does mean that we have a certain amount of flexibility and there is money that's, that's coming in um, on an annual basis. Now, most of the time when people complain, but the academics don't have money, we need to better define what academics we're working with. Um, I think where the frustration comes about is what I call the big, the big pool of, of starting of, of, of junior scholars, okay, and that includes master's students, uh, doctoral students, even maybe postdoctoral students. Oftentimes, they don't. It, it, it's a bit of a catch twenty two. They're the ones who need the money the most, but they don't have any funding yet. And as you climb the ladder, there's more and more funds that you know about. You know how to procure research grants, and the university itself says, I want to invest in this professor because I know they will represent us and they are doing good work. So, 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 I, I, so when, I, when we say academics don't have money, that's partially true. But if we know how to, if we really are experts and we go through the training and we are continually learning and we do the proper research as part of our, as part of our work, so I do believe that the more senior scholars have those funds and can pay for it. And I want to demonstrate this. This is a this is a um, graph I found, or just a chart that I found online, um, about how much money goes into one article. Okay, and I was shocked about this. And obviously, it varies widely depending on what field and what land and 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 where you are and what university. So don't take this take this with you know with a grain of salt. Um, but even if, let's say, the $400,000 for one article seems exaggerated, and I think it does, even if it's a quarter of that, okay, 
They put in the time, let's say it's a scientific article, they put in the, mind, the resources, and when I say they, I mean the university. Put in the resources for the lab. They put in the, the, the resources for the personnel, for the student, for the equipment, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Now let me give you a scenario. They've done all that, and a scholar has come up with groundbreaking research in the area of cancer treatment. And he or she thinks that this study is going to be a breakthrough and can potentially save people's lives. However, they don't know or appreciate or realize the value of translation or editing. So they say, I'm going to let my science speak for itself and write it in their own language. They then submit it to nature, to pediatrics, wherever it may be, expecting that this is going to blow everybody away and change and change the scientific you know, field that they're in. And then they get a rejection letter a week later. And they're shocked and dismayed and appalled and say, how could this potentially be? And the answer is, and we'll see a graph about this soon, but the answer is that a lot of these journals, and this is what we need to keep in mind, this is, this is our goal, and I'll repeat this a few times, our goal is to help them publish their research, not to translate or edit their article, even though that's what we're doing, but our, the goal is to get them published, assuming we can, assuming it's valid and, 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 and worthwhile research. And, 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 and so getting back, to the, getting back to the story with our cancer researcher, the journal editor receives hundreds, if not thousands, of submissions every year and quickly reads through. They read through the title, they read through the abstract, and only if it merits do they continue on to the article itself. Now, if I haven't taken the time as a researcher to polish up that language, and, or if the way I've written has made it convoluted and unclear, and my study doesn't come across properly. So the journal editor says to themselves, I'm not sure how serious this individual is. And if this is how they write, then what does their science look like? So therefore, um, I think it's really critical that we keep things into perspective when we think people don't have money. There, is, there are funds available. And if we can convey the value of, our, of what it is that we do, I think the, some of that funding will be um, given over to them. Okay. All right. This this is really interesting research that I found online. So I, I, I spent the last five minutes telling you that countries and universities pay for research. Of course they do. Well, it depends where you are, and it depends how much research is of value. Um, I was surprised by some of these results. Now, this is R&D spending per GDP, okay? Um, and I would have expected, I don't know, maybe you know, U.S. and Canada to be at the top. It's not necessarily so. U.S. is, is on the list. Um, I guess I take some pride in the fact that my home country is, is number one, but that could just be because we don't have too many people. Um, but, and, and interestingly enough, our, our, the home for this conference, Greece, is on the list of poorest spending. Now, I want to clarify, this does not mean this is how much they spend on translation. That data, I don't think, is around or available or is necessarily accessible. But I do think it reflects the value that the um, college or that the country gives to um, that to research and to research and development. So, and and that will be reflected in some of the budgets that are that are allocated to the universities, and in turn, how much money an individual scholar or a university may have to pay you. So, think about your language sense for a second, and see where they are if, if they're on this list. Uh, and by the way, this is this is you know easily accessible with all the with additional countries as well. I just wanted to make the notable ones um, and think about what that what that reflects. For example, unfortunately, for whatever reason, in South America, it seems they don't value research as much as Europe. So, what does that mean for you know Spanish translation, or what does that mean for other things? And it, and it and it depends on that doesn't you know I'm, I'm making broad strokes and generalizations here. Um, but it is something that's worthwhile to think about. Okay. What is academic translation? Right? What does that include? We consider ourselves academic translators and editors. How do we define those terms? And how do our clients or scholars define those terms? Um, so I've put up a list of you know, uh, different, uh, different avenues that one can go with academic research. I've been referring a lot to journal articles, but there's all sorts of other things. Uh, there are books, right? A book can keep us busy for a year or two, if it's a good book. Um, 
uh, there are lectures at conferences. In fact, many times what happens is there's a lecture at a conference, someone's developing an idea, they write it up, we translate it and edit it. Two months later, they say, okay, I got some great feedback from the conference, now it's an article, we, we help them with that. They get rejected, we've now, maybe from the top place they wanted to go, they now need help with the formatting to a, a different style sheet, or they need some edits, or they need some revisions. Then that gets accepted for publication, and then they decide, okay, let's take this theme and expand it and turn it into a book. So one project can have many evolutions. Um, and there's all sorts of other things that that, surround, that I've found, in, in my experience, sort of grow out of um, you know pure academic translations, to the point where, where we get requests from marketing departments and universities, because from their perspective, right, this is a brilliant translator. Does he do academic? What does academic mean? They don't necessarily have those distinctions in their brain between pure research and you know, more marketing stuff. Now, we have to decide, is that something that we want to do, or is that something that we feel is out of our comfort zone, and maybe we want to refer them to a colleague. Um, but it's, it's good for us to sort of expand our horizons and think about what's included when we talk about academic translation. We talk about author, right? We, a lot of times we think about author editing, but maybe there's, we can open it up a little bit and open ourselves to new work. Um, we also want to think about, um, we also want to think about who needs academic translation, right? So, yeah, of course there's universities and colleges, but there's also think tanks. There's also government institutions. There's also research centers that are not necessarily directly connected uh, to universities and academia, uh, but are very much rooted in research and need the skills that we provide and the skills that we present. Okay. Um, all right. I've talked for long enough. I haven't heard any of you. Um, can can you please, um, uh, uh, by hands, tell me? From start to finish, what is the process of publishing a paper? What's the process that a scholar needs to go through? First step. Shout it out. You don't even need to raise your hand. Write the paper. Okay. Research. So let's, I would assume that the research needs to come before the writing. In fact, in the, in the scholar's head, in, the, in, the, in terms of timeline, writing is almost the last step, or is in, at least in terms of chronologically. What else? Okay, so do a literature review and see what's out there. That's even before we even do the research, because why well, spend two years doing research that's already been presented elsewhere? Which, by the way, I read. I was on the plane this morning reading a, a fascinating paper about how we deal with the fact that scholars don't always necessarily know what's been published in languages that are not their own, right? Which may be very parallel to what they're doing. Okay, what's what comes later? What peer review? Okay, peer review is definitely definitely a part, right? We. Submit the scholar submits the article to whatever journal they, they want, and then um, and then the journal comes back, the editor comes back with peer review, whether it's blind, double blind, whatever it may be. What else? We haven't mentioned translation and editing. Come on, that's that's like that's why we're here, right? But before we get the paper, yeah. we've had colleagues or she has colleagues go through and come up with ideas. I hope so. I hope so. I it, it, so it's a fascinating topic. I don't want to get too much on a tangent. Um, I will say that I've had scholars who I felt that they're not ready for translation or anything. Right? They just it's not um, it's not ready enough. And I will tell them, have you you know given this to some of your colleagues? And they say, no, they're going to steal my research. There is a big paranoia in our in our world about uh, the value and the results, and and it's a big Pandora's box that I'm not going to open now. But I will say that it's something that I highly encourage. Um, in fact, on academia.edu, if you're familiar, they actually have a feature now where you can open up your draft of a paper for comments, which has its pluses and minuses. Um, but I highly encourage scholars to do that. They don't always do it. I wish they did. Um, especially younger scholars who, you know, their advisors, their colleagues. Um, one of the things that drives me, one of the things that wasn't mentioned, and I, it's important to mention, is choosing a journal. We'll discuss that in a second. Um, choosing a journal is, is fascinating. I oftentimes, tell me if you've had similar experiences, people call us up and say, not only can you translate or edit my paper, but can you tell me which journal to publish it? Yeah, you've had that before? Okay, so I seem to have this, fairly often, especially with younger scholars, 
And it's sort of puzzling to me because I say, well, look at your bibliography. Where are you taking your research from? That should get you, if you're reading those journals and you're on the right track, that should at least give you a starting point for where you should be looking to publish your research. Um, anyway, okay. All right, let's, uh, let's talk for a second about why articles are rejected. Okay, so I alluded to this before. Let's look at this picture for a second. This is, a, this is an image which portrays how, how journal editors themselves admit to what they look at when a submission is, uh, is brought to their desk or is they receive by you. Most of them look at the title, they all look at the title. A lesser percentage look at the abstract and then the lesser And that's pretty appalling and, and, and disturbing if we think about how much work, and we talked about how much money is poured into all these articles prior, but it also is the truth, it's also reality. Uh, which means, and, and, and even more ironic, is that sometimes the, um, the paper is only, the abstract is only written in haste a few minutes before the submission, because they write the paper, they think it's great, and then they forget that an abstract is a critical part. They write the abstract very quickly, may have it edited, may have it translated, maybe not, and submit it and then wonder why they reject it. Uh, now, I do agree that the abstract should be at the end, because it should be after you have fully formed all of your thoughts and written them down. However, it can't be written in haste and it can't be written uh, without thinking it through. Um, let's just run through quickly the reasons the articles are rejected. Um, it fails the technical screening, right? Every journal has author guidelines, has style sheets. Um, not every scholar follows those to the T. In fact, most of them don't. Um, and some journals simply will not look at a paper that does not follow their requirements. Uh, one of the most common things I see, uh, a paper is, a, a journal accepts papers from 3,000 to 6,000 words, and I get an article with 9,000 words in it, right? And they're shocked that they can't submit this article. Right? Um, okay, it does not fall within the aims and scope, right? Um, oftentimes, scholars, especially more junior ones, want to shoot for the stars, and they have heard from their colleagues that this is nature, is the place, you want to make your career, publish in nature. Well, you're probably wasting your time, because they're rejecting 99% of articles, and your article may or may not be appropriate. You have to do some research, do some homework into which journals are appropriate. Um, the procedures and or analysis are seen as defective. Uh, the conclusions aren't justified. <laughs> I had a scholar a few, a few weeks ago. Uh, from the University of Israel and he, in the field of computer science. And he did, he was doing a study on, uh, on social media, and his study cons can, uh, consisted of himself and one other individual. And he wanted to reach far gone conclusions from this study about himself. Now, it put me in an uncomfortable situation because I, I know this, is, this article is not going to be accepted. Um, on the other hand, is that my job to tell him? I'm not sure. Um, uh, it's simply an extension of a different paper. Number five, number six, it's incomprehensible. Okay, And, and you see that there's a link here to, to where I, I took some of these ideas from. Now, a lot of what I've been saying now is as background to understanding the picture from our client's perspective, from the scholar's perspective. We can't help them with all this. Okay, I want to make that very clear. We need to understand what we can help them with and what we can't and where our added value is and where it isn't. Obviously, number six is our, it, it, well, no, I shouldn't say it's, we're not, our job is not to take something that's incomprehensible and make it comprehensible, but our job is to take something that is written in another language and translate it um, and make sure it's polished or edit it in, in English. And, oh, no, clicking the wrong button. Here we go. Um, okay, so we talked before about what are the stages of publication. So. My argument is that, number one, the first stage needs to be choosing a journal for publication. Now, you may say, well, like, do the research first, and then you figure out where it is. That's, that's fine. The problem is, is that it's sort of trying to fit a circle into a square afterwards. Because the scholar does their research, and, and then at the end, they want to find a journal it may or may, may or may not be appropriate for any one of a number of journals in their field. Um, and it's important that 
It doesn't, you don't need to choose a journal and say it's got to be this one, but you should have certain ones in mind. Even a writing style may differ from journal to journal, and that requires homework. That requires reading the articles in your field to understand where would this be appropriate. And a well-read scholar will know the journals in their field. Um, what, the, what the impact factor is, right? How many times is it quoted in other papers? That's a key indicator uh, about how it's going to be accepted. I don't want to overstate this. Impact factor should be taken as a factor, but not overstated. And, and, and oftentimes, impact factor becomes the all and end all. And it, what ends up happening, ironically, is that scholars chase after the high impact factor articles or the high impact factor journals, and then it takes them two or three years because these are the journals that allow themselves the time to take it as long as they want to get back to the scholar. And it's rejected. Sometimes that negative feedback comes to us because, right, if it was rejected, maybe it wasn't the scholar's fault, maybe it was the translator editor's fault, or at least that's how they feel. Um, and it was unrealistic in the first place. So the most important thing is back to number one, is matching interest to the journal. The, the article has to fit the journal. And if you see ahead of time, this is not a good fit, it's not a good match based on your experience, I think it is okay, it doesn't matter your responsibility, but it is okay to, to, to say something. Um, Acceptance percentage is a really interesting stat that, that can be helpful to scholars. Um, you know, does, this, does this journal accept 1% of papers or 50% of papers? Um, the length of the article we talked about before, it's got to be appropriate to the, to the journal. The speed of response time is critical, especially for younger scholars, right? Again, you take two, three years because some of these back and forth can take months, if not years and then it's rejected at the end, those are valuable years. So maybe it's worthwhile to try and publish the same paper in a lower level journal, okay? Um, but to get that experience, to understand what feedback, what revise and resubmit is, and then work from there. Um, and number six is up to you, or is up to the scholar, because it depends on what culture and society and what journal you're turning to, but reach out to the editor. There may be ways to informally reach out to editors, especially if you have colleagues that are connected, and ask them, here is my idea for a paper, or here is my paper. Do you think that this is something that potentially you'd be interested in? Some editors won't like that, okay? But there are some, if it's done in the right way, who will, who will give you an honest answer, say, listen, you know what? I don't think it's worth your time investing in this because it's really not what our journal focuses on. Um, I gave you some tools here to give to, to your clients, to your scholars, um, which you'd be surprised, many of them don't know about, about how to find what the impact factor of journal is, journals are, um, how to find journals if they ask you what journals should be published in, and what the acceptance percentages are. Um, and, fi and finally, be realistic. 80% um, of articles are rejected, so it doesn't necessarily mean you did bad work if the article wasn't accepted. In fact, it most likely has something to do with something else. Okay. We talked a lot about the clients. Now let's talk about us. Now let's focus on us for a second, because in the end of the day, we want to improve our um, knowledge and understanding and our ability to, to deliver to the client. So what I think are, is really critical is what I call tangibles, okay? And oftentimes, in my, when I started out as a translator and editor, I didn't know how to differentiate between the different services that could potentially come up as part of translating an article. I thought translating an article is translating an article. It's a text, comes in, I translate, I send it back to you, you have a revision, we're done. Not so, okay? Um, if you, and, and I want to break it down into parts for a very critical reason. That is, we need to know how to, pri first of all, we can offer these as different services instead of just saying, there's a one price for everybody no matter what you need, okay? And I think that's, that's a really important to do. And even more so, is we need to figure out which of these things can we do, and we'll go through them in a sec. Which of these things can't we do? Which of these things can we do but we want to charge as an extra? And which of these things maybe we can do, and we're just going to do it for the scholar, right? As what we call in Israel a doesn't take too much time, but for the scholar it can be invaluable. Even, even providing, in the previous slide, providing them some of those resources, sometimes 
scholars are indebted, right? I never knew this existed. So even that can be something that takes two minutes of our time that really makes us invaluable. Um, okay, so let's go through the one by one. Translating and editing the text we talked about. Formatting the article according to the style sheet, okay? Not always fun work. We have to decide whether it's something we want to do or don't want to do. What's important for, what's important for us to know is that sometimes it's an expectation and sometimes it's understood by the client that I'm going to give you the article, I've written it however I want, I've pasted in the references however I want, and now you make sense of it, and you make sure it's APA 6th edition and exactly what the journal wants. Or maybe the journal has developed their own style sheet. That's really fun, right? Because now I need to go learn an entirely new style sheet just for one project. Price it separately, I'm begging you. Um, because it's not the same amount of work to translate a lecture for a conference, which has no footnotes, and no formatting, and no style sheet, and translating a, or editing a manuscript, which two-thirds of the page are just footnotes. The amount, clock yourselves, next time you're doing two similar projects like that, you'll see, it's probably four times the amount of time dealing with all the, um, with all the technical work. Again, decide whether you want to do it. I suggest that you do consider taking that on, because I do think that it makes you more invaluable. On the other hand, charge for it. It's time, it's energy, it's work. Um, researching primary sources and titles for books and names. Okay, if we're translating, this could be a never-ending issue. We've got texts that have been trans that the, the author translated um, that we now need to go back and find the original source. We've got texts that we need to um, we need to find the source. We need to go to the library to find where this came from. Um, all sorts of different issues that come up whereby we can't simply translate. We have to actually do some research. Now, there are a lot of online tools, and if we're familiar with them, then it can be very helpful to us, but it still takes time, and it's something that we need to consider whether we want to do or not. Um, footnotes and bibliography, um, we, we touched on. Um, and rewriting, okay, rewriting your cover letter or personal bio. This is, you could say, that's not part of my job. This is a chupar that I mentioned before. It's a small present which takes us five, ten minutes. And you will find the scholars will now love you. I do this for free as a policy. Write your cover letter at, in, in whatever language you feel comfortable. Send it to me. It takes me about five, ten minutes to do. And all of a sudden, I have gained a client for life because they trust me. Oftentimes, I don't know about your experiences, it's not written in a very... Uh, politically correct, or I don't know if that's the right term, but in a in a respectful way that that appreciates the editor's time and the reviewer's time, um, and that's important. Um, and number six is miscellaneous, so that includes indexing, transliteration, graphs and tables. You can think of all sorts of other stuff that come up. It, it can be part of your price point. You don't need to necessarily you know detail every single thing you're going to do. You can if you want. That's fine. But think about it before you send out a quote. Sometimes we feel this rush of like, the client wants it, wants this quote as soon as possible, so we're just gonna look at the word count in Microsoft Word and hope for the best. And then we get stuck six months later doing the same article um, because, because of this. So, so these are our tangibles. We need to think through each one of these six, and if there are more than others, which one are our base services, which one are our add-ons, and which ones are which ones do we not do at all, and which ones are our two parts? Yes, please. Yeah, it's the big unknown, right? How much of a how much of a pain or how pedantic the scholar will be. Um, I had a situation last week whereby an author turned around, we did a sample for them, about a two-page sample, and they said there was one word that was mistakenly translated, and therefore I don't know if you can handle this text. And I said, if you're looking for perfection on the first go-round, you, you may never have this text in English. It may stay in Hebrew for the rest of your life, because it, it and, and, and every, and you only, the problem is you only find that out afterwards. Uh, the only thing I would I, I could say about that is I don't think there's a problem turning around for if, if it does go well and if it's someone you want to continue with uh, to turn around the second time and say you know 
this is going to be my rate uh, for the second project. For the first project, it, it, it's hard. It's hard to know exactly. What you can do is ask inquisitive questions. Why? Who have you been using until now? Why didn't it work out with them? What were some of the issues? And that can give you a, get you into their minds a little bit. Okay, follow up. This is critical. Um, and what I call upselling. Upselling your translation means, okay, you've sold them a product, so we're finished, right? We can go home. No, upselling means how, do we, how can we add on to whatever we've already given them? So if we know that there's 98% of the time, even for articles that are accepted, there's always gonna be a revise and resubmit. And revise means, revisions, and sometimes it's a significant part of the article, that should be charged. I, I see online services out there that say, we'll take care of any revisions that you need. I don't know. I think that's idiotic, uh, personally, because maybe you need to rewrite the entire article. I don't think you should be doing it. Um, so that's important. New sections for translation that are sent. Reformatting for a new journal, right? It's rejected. Now, I was in APA. Now it needs to go to Chicago, right? If the scholar was smart, they would use some of the online software, such as EndNote or uh, or Mendeley or others, uh, Zotero, um, but I find that the majority don't still don't use those, and therefore that's something that we can get paid for. Um, what do we need to be careful about? Don't promise to accept to any specific journal. This can be a big a big mistake. Say and don't. I wouldn't even recommend journals. I wouldn't even say publish here. That's their job, not your job. Um, don't be sucked into changing research itself, right? Sometimes editing, right? I love the word editing because people understand totally different things. Some people, editing is just proof my paper, which is really ready to go, I just, you know, sure. To, basically I want you to rewrite my paper, but I don't want to say that straight out, so I call it editing, right? Editing is way too generic a term. We need to get down to the nitty gritty and find out exactly what they want us to do. And if they want us to rewrite their paper, we say, you're the scholar. Or, we can do it, but I don't recommend it. Um, and new work equals new payment. This is not a one-time fee, and now they can come back forever. Have specific terms. Agree on the project. How long? How much time do they have to submit revisions? All right? Can they come back to you two years later? I had a client who came back to me a month ago, and with with comments from the his journal from 2015 that we worked on the project. On the one hand, I wanted to help them. On the other hand, I wasn't I wasn't sure. So we have to think about these things. Um, and for sure, if it's new text, it's new payment. Okay, quickly, because we need to finish up. Um, the downside to academic translation, there's a, we talked about this, a lot of revisions, challenging, the clients can sometimes be very pedantic and challenging, it's a slow pace, um, and it takes time until we prove ourselves and establish ourselves, a lot of word of mouth. It's not saying that we're gonna, we're not selling dresses that were inspired, you know, by the, by the design and someone buys it on the spot, it takes time. Um, so how do we perfect our skills and how do we get new clients? Number one, if we study in university, this could be translation studies, or it could be other studies. That's an added bonus. I'm an art history major. All of a sudden, art history professors, I have a value of bond uh, on everyone else. Um, offer our services to professors, colleagues, and friends. I started personally. I started with my own college. I went to my own professors. In fact, even more than that, my professor came to me after I was lazy and said, I don't want to write in Hebrew. I want to write in English. Do you mind? He was impressed with my work and said, oh, I have an article. Do you want to translate it? And naively, I thought, how hard could this be? Um, and it took six months later, I was still working on it. Um, but, uh, but that's where to start. It's, it's, the, it's the people we already know. Um, only work in your top fields and language set. Please don't write that you know Swahili, French, Spanish, Chinese. I don't believe it. Um, and especially with academia. Um, make meaningful contributions on social media. Where Find where academics are hanging out. Um, physically or online, and answer their questions, be involved in conversations so that you're a known individual. Um, and attend academic conferences. You can, I, there was a time where I would crash academic conferences. Sometimes they can be small and intimate, and I would just go up to people. There's, there is a woman in Israel who I have a, who were colleagues, and what she does, I think is what we call chutzpah, okay? She will take someone, if she likes a scholar, a scholar's research. She will take it, she will rip it up, and by rip it up I mean edit it till it's, till it's totally redone, then find a conference where that scholar is attending, will approach them after their lecture and say, here is your paper the way it should have been written. Call me. Um, which I think, which I do not have the guts to do. 
But I also appreciate, but she said she has great feedback. People love it. They say, I'm so happy that you did this. Um, that's pretty extreme, but that's a possibility. Um, okay, social media, where do these scholars hang out? So this is just a few ideas for different fora um, that scholars hang out in research date and academia, I highly recommend. Controversies about them aside, um, they're a great place to meet uh, academic scholars to be involved in what's going on, to know what's in the field. That's it, I'm finished. Um, I run Academic Language Experts. Um, our goal is to help scholars publish their research in different languages. Obviously, English is our main target language. Um, English editing is, we do a lot of English editing. Um, here's our website. If you want the slides, please do feel free to send me an email. Um, you can give me a phone call afterwards. I'm here the whole day. I'd really be happy to me personally hear about like what sort of work you're doing, what you agree with here, what you disagree with from your own experiences and in your own country. Um, it was a pleasure. Thank you for having me, and uh, enjoy the rest of the conference. Does anyone have a urgent question for Ravi? We're a little over schedule. If you do, by all means, raise your hand. Otherwise, I'm happy to close the session. I have a very small token of Elias' appreciation for Abby. Thank you very much for your talk and making the day. Thank you very much. Appreciate it.